Okay, today we are going to talk about early childhood, body and mind, so the biological aspect of it. We're talking about the ages between two and six, so this is actually a prime time for learning. What we see during these ages is that the weight and the height increases, but the relationship between those measurements changes because children start to become slimmer and their lower body starts to lengthen, so they are getting different proportions. Their center of gravity moves from the breastbone all the way down to the belly button. So they're getting better balance now for their height. And the BMI, the body mass index, is lower than at any other point in time in their lives. The BMI is basically just a measure of height and weight that tells doctors if you are within a normal range or if you're overweight or obese or even morbidly obese. So children have a low BMI right now. Part of the problem is, though, that children do not play outside as much as they used to, and growth of the body slows down, so they start to burn fewer calories at this point in time. So nutrition becomes a big problem, and nutrition becomes really important because during this stage in life, obesity is actually a more frequent problem than malnutrition is. Low-income families have a tendency to want to feed their children as much as possible to make sure that they're getting enough food. But what happens is a lot of times parents, especially working parents, rely on fast foods. And these are not nutritious at all. So children are vulnerable to obesity. And the problem is because they're so young, they can't cook their own food they do not really know what nutritious food is because they kind of learn from their parents and their peers and everybody they're surrounded by. So if they're being given this to eat, then they think they should eat. A lot of times parents will reward children for finishing their dinner, you know, by saying something like, if you finish all your food, you'll get a dessert. And that can become a problem because children will have a tendency to overeat and Parents will have a tendency to overfeed their children just to make sure that they have enough calories. But the bottom line is that their calorie requirement is actually lower because body growth has slowed and play has actually slowed down. So overfeeding is actually causing an epidemic of these illnesses that are associated with obesity like heart disease and diabetes. We are seeing these rise incredibly over the last few years, and it doesn't look like it's going to end anytime soon. There was once a mother on a talk show whose two-year-old, I believe it was, weighed like 100 pounds. It was absolutely crazy. And she basically said that she feeds him to shut him up because he cries. So she feeds him to get him to stop crying, and she feeds him to make him happy. Well, this baby was eating ungodly amounts of food and ended up putting on so much weight that then he had respiratory issues and diabetes and all sorts of other things. But the mother said the bottom line was she was going to feed her kid as long as he was crying so that he would shut up basically. So we really need to watch what we feed our children, especially during this time period. Children who eat more vegetables and fewer fried foods usually gain bone mass instead of fat. So that's really a good thing. Uh, you want your kids to gain bone mass, especially because at this point in time, their skeletons are growing, their muscle mass is growing, and the skeleton needs to be able to support that. Younger children seem to be compulsive about their daily routine, and this is normal. They usually start to disappear by the time we get to middle childhood, which is the next stage. But toddlers basically need to be offered a variety of healthy foods. So you can't just assume that they're not going to like green beans or broccoli or anything like that. They need to balance their need for a routine with healthy things. So if you do not offer your children healthy things, they're not going to even try them or like them. And I'll give you an example. My oldest daughter used to stay with her grandma a lot. And her grandma would feed her chicken nuggets because that's what she wanted. She wanted chicken nuggets, so her grandmother gave them to her. My two younger children were brought up more in a daycare setting 
where they fed them a variety of foods and, you know, had them try new things before they just said, no, I'm not going to eat it. And now my two youngest children to this day eat a wider variety of foods than my older child. And that's simply because she wasn't exposed to them as much as she should have been. Unfortunately, I was going to school full time, so I wasn't around as much as I would have liked to have been. But, you know, it just kind of goes to show you that children do need variety to balance out what they want on a daily basis. You know, chicken nuggets, especially from like McDonald's, aren't the healthiest thing to feed your child every day. Um, but we understand the pressures of working and trying to take care of your kids and wanting things that are convenient and easy. So we need to try to balance everything out. About 8% of young children have a food allergy to a common healthy food. Cow's milk, eggs, peanuts are frequent allergies. Depending on what you're allergic to, the treatment may vary and diagnosis may vary. If you're allergic to things like shellfish and like bee stings and things like that, oftentimes you have a more serious reaction. Peanuts is a big one. And oftentimes you have a more serious reaction and need what's called an EpiPen, which is basically epinephrine. My son is allergic to bee stings, so I carry an EpiPen around with me everywhere I go. So basically it's just epinephrine, which you kind of jam it into their leg, and then the epinephrine goes to their heart and bronchial tubes and opens up their airways so they can breathe. Because what happens is once they get this food that they're allergic to, they start to swell up, their tongue starts to swell, their throat starts to swell, their bronchial tubes start to get constricted, and epinephrine immediately reverses all of that. So I have to take them to the hospital just to make sure that they're checked out okay, because as I said, epinephrine does speed up your heart, but the alter but much better than the alternative. Teeth are actually affected by diet and illness too. And it's really important to take care of teeth even when children are young because what they found is that if you don't take care of your teeth when you're young, your permanent teeth can actually be impaired because your baby teeth are right in front of and underneath your permanent teeth. And your permanent teeth will come down and push the baby teeth out. If the baby teeth are decayed at the top, then that could touch the permanent teeth and actually start decaying the permanent teeth. So your child could actually have permanent teeth come in with cavities. So you want to make sure that you take care of your child's teeth from the get-go. Teach them how to brush their teeth. Take them to the dentist. Because teeth are actually affected by diet and illness. Sweets, sugars, of course, are going to de decay your teeth at a really high rate. Acids, like in pop or soda, as you call it, will promote tooth decay. So you want to kind of try to counteract that. Tooth decay actually also correlates with obesity. So again, you want to try to make sure that the teeth, the permanent teeth, come in and are not impacted. You also want to be careful with things like bottles and um, pacifiers because if your child sucks on a bottle too much or a pacifier too much when they are still developing their palate, their top of their mouth, the roof of their mouth, that can actually start to form around the pacifier and then their roof of their mouth will be too thin, too narrow for all of their teeth to come in. And they may have to have expanders put in and all sorts of other problems. So by the age of two, the child's brain is about 75% of what it will be in adulthood. By six, it's about 90%. So that's pretty significant strides that we're making. From two to six, the prefrontal cortex matures a lot. Sleep becomes more regular. They have a larger frontal lobe. So executive functioning, planning, that's all going to start maturing. 
emotions actually become more responsive and more, um, that's what I'm looking for, more appropriate. So they have the appropriate emotional response to things happening. Temper tantrums start to decrease or go away entirely. And they do not have those fits of laughter and tears very much anymore. But it really helps that the brain is maturing so much during this time. So we really have to make sure, again, because nutrition is going to impact brain development. And remember, we talked about head sparing before, where your brain can be protected from malnutrition temporarily. So this is a really important time for brain development. So we need to make sure they have adequate nutrition. The corpus callosum is the part that actually connects the left and the right hemispheres of the brain. It's nerve fibers and it runs all the way across the bottom of the brain, basically. So this grows and myelinates rapidly during early childhood so that the two sides of the brain can communicate. So now the right side and the left side can talk to each other, which is very important in brain development. Myelination is when the axons of the nerves get wrapped in a sheath, and what it does is it helps insulate them and also speeds up transmission. So those nerve impulses get a lot faster. Lateralization starts, and this basically refers to the fact that one side of the brain is dominant for each activity. Keep in mind that no one has complete lateralization. It's not that the right brain can only do this and the left brain can only do that. It's just that one side is usually better at it than the other. But even if you lose function on one side of your brain or the other, oftentimes your brain can kind of pick up the slack. And let's say your left side of the brain has an injury, your right side of the brain will actually try to compensate for that. Left-handedness is more accepted now than it was a century ago. They used to actually try to discourage being left-handed in many cultures. And if their child was actually writing with their left hand or started doing things with their left hand, they would actually purposely switch it to their right hand to try to make them right-handed, basically. A lot of left-handed people have issues still, especially, I know, with desks in school. But things just really aren't made for right or left-handed people because there's so many right-handed people in the world. So this can really become a problem. So around the age of four, children start to actually sort things out and they can start categorizing them like by color and shape and things like that. So what they do is when they see their children sorting things, picking them up with their left hand, they will actually take it out and put it into their right hand. So they say that the right side of the brain is your creativity, your emotions, music, poetry, that kind of thing. And that the left side of the brain is science, mathematics, logic. So you may have heard people say I'm left-brained or right-brained. And like I said, those sides of the brain are more dominant for that, but it doesn't mean that they're solely for that. So if I had to say, I would say I was left-brained because I am more scientific and logical and analytical than I am creative. I don't understand how people write music and all of that. So I would say I'm left-brained, but again, it's not about one or the other. And your left side of your brain controls the right side of your body, and your right side of your brain controls the left side of the body. So originally they were thinking that if you were left-brained, you'd be right-handed, and if you were right-brained, you'd be left-handed. But research has shown that not all creative people are left-handed, and not all scientific people are right-handed. So that kind of got disproved. So again, 
what we found is this left-right distinction has been exaggerated over time. No one is exclusively one or the other. Both sides are actually involved in all aspects of our lives. So again, the myelination that occurs during this time is the primary reason that thinking becomes faster. The myelination itself increases the speed of transmission. And as I said, it's that fatty coating, that sheath that surrounds the axons. So by age six, most children can see and immediately name an object, which is actually a precursor to reading ability. So they can see a bottle and say bottle immediately. Perseveration is when some children persevere and stick with one thought or action and they're unable to quit. So the prefrontal cortex is starting to mature and it gradually enables children to focus their attention and start to curb their impulses. So before this happens, a lot of young children can't sit still, they can't sit quiet, they will jump from task to task, they'll be very impulsive. Others act in the opposite way. They persevere, they stick to their thought or action, and they're unable to quit. So this could be because of the immaturity of the prefrontal cortex. It could just be poor impulse control, which poor impulse control in this early childhood could indicate a personality disorder in adulthood. So one could lead to another, but this myelination that we're talking about proceeds for years. It continues for years and years. Children with attention hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, are too impulsive for their age. So there's an imbalance between the left and the right sides of that prefrontal cortex and an abnormal growth of the corpus callosum that seem to underlie ADHD. So basically what happens is we have our prefrontal cortex here and the left side develops differently than the right side. So there's an imbalance of maturation here. And then the corpus callosum that connects the right and left hemispheres is abnormally growing. So the connection between the left and the right sides of the brain is not what it should be. So they think that these children can't control their impulses and can't really pay attention for very long because of this. The limbic system is not necessarily a part, more its parts of the brain, but these are crucial in expressing and regulating our emotions. The amygdala is actually a very tiny brain structure, but it registers emotions like fear and anxiety and sometimes rage. They're actually doing some studies on prisoners and they're trying to figure out if criminals, violent criminals versus nonviolent criminals versus regular people, if there's a difference in their amygdala. Because the hypothesis is that violent criminals have more activity in their amygdala or their amygdalas are malformed in some way so that they have all this rage that they can't control. The hippocampus is the processor of memory, especially for locations. But anytime you learn something and remember something, your hippocampus is involved. And the hypothalamus does about everything. It's the area that responds to both the amygdala and the hippocampus, and it produces hormones and activates other parts of the brain and body. So hormones are produced by endocrine glands and the hypothalamus. But then the hypothalamus also controls what's called the pituitary gland. And the pituitary gland, which we'll talk about at a later point, makes hormones that control a lot of other things in the body. So the hypothalamus controls everything from feeling full to body temperature regulation. So the hypothalamus is a very important structure in our body. And as I said, we'll talk about it more later. PJ 
we're now in pre-operational thought. Remember, we were in sensory motor thought before. Now we're pre-operational. So pre is before, and this is before logical operations, so before we can reason. So the child's verbal ability to speak actually permits symbolic thinking. So language is really what the difference is between this stage and the sensory motor stage. The sensory motor stage, they had their senses to take in sensory things and their motor function to move and react and things like that, but they didn't have language to communicate. Now we have that language, so we're not limited to just our senses and just moving. So sometimes we can have, like we have an object or word that stands for something else, and now children are able to do that. So they can actually coordinate that this object or this word stands for something else. As children mature, though, they start to realize that there are characteristics of themselves that they have in common with other children, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, before they actually mature, they believe in what's called animism, which animism is when natural objects are alive and non-human animals will have the same characteristics as humans do. So a lot of times in children's stories, this is what happens. Objects can talk and animals can talk. And that's the whole point of these children's stories. And children during this stage can actually believe these stories. But as the child ages, this starts to disappear. And they start to realize that only other humans have things in common with them. So what prevents children from thinking logically right now? Well, there's a few things. Centration is one of them. This is a characteristic where a child focuses on one idea and excludes all other ideas. Like they can understand that mommy is a mother, but they can't understand that mommy is a sister or mommy is a daughter. So it's just that one idea and they can't think about anything else. Egocentrism is the tendency to think about the world only from their perspective. So they can't think of it from anybody else's perspective, basically. Everything revolves around them kind of thing. They have a tendency to focus on appearance, so they ignore all other attributes that are not apparent. So they think that things are whatever they appear to be. So for example, if they know that boys have short hair, if they see a girl with short hair, they'll say that it's a boy because they have short hair and if they have short hair, they must be a boy. So they kind of get stuck on that. Static reasoning is where children think that nothing changes. Whatever is now has always been and always will be. So for example, mommy. Mommy was never a child. Mommy will never be old. Mommy is mommy, and that's how she will stay forever. It's hard for children to understand if grandma's talking, saying that mommy is my daughter, and mommy used to be little. They don't understand that. And then irreversibility is where they think that nothing can be undone. So once something happens, it can never be restored to the way it was before the change. So a simple example is if you make them a sandwich and you put lettuce on their sandwich and they don't want lettuce on their sandwich, so you take the lettuce off. Well, that's not good enough for them because they think that the sandwich is ruined now. You can't make that sandwich the way it was before you put the lettuce on there. So things can't go back in a nutshell. 
conservation is basically just the principle stating that even if something's appearance changes, the amount of the substance stays the same. So you pour liquids in two different size glasses, and even though they know that you poured the same amount in each glass because the shape is different, they don't understand that the amount of substance stays the same. So if you pour liquid into the taller glass there first, and then even pour that liquid directly into the fatter, shorter glass, they won't understand that it's still the same amount of liquid. They will say that the taller glass has more simply because it's taller. So they don't understand that even though you change the shape of the liquid, the liquid itself hasn't changed. So here's some experiments that they did. So two equal glasses of liquid. You pour one into a taller glass and ask which glass is more, and they say the taller one. We have two lines of checkers, and then you increase the spacing in one line. Which line has more? They say the longer one. If you have two sticks, you move one stick over and ask which stick is longer, they'll say the one farther to the right. So they don't understand that even though you've just moved something or changed its appearance, it's still the same. Vygotsky was with social learning, as we know. So he believed that culture and education were embedded in a children's cognitive development. He believed that mentors were supposed to present challenges and provide guidance as the knowledgeable sources. But remember that he believed in guided participation. So mentors offer assistance, but don't take over and do it for them because he believed that the student, so to speak, had to help in their own learning. So you add information, you encourage motivation, but you don't do it for them because it's kind of like all your classes that you have. As a professor, I can only show you so much and try to guide you, give you the information that you need. As a student, though, you have to take what I give you and actually utilize it. So you have to be a participant in your own learning. And that's basically what Vygotsky believed. The zone of proximal development was his term for the skills that a person can only do with assistance. They can't perform them independently yet. Scaffolding is basically temporary supporting them. So you help them master the task by giving them support along the way. So you take what they can't do well and you help them get well at it. So if you, for example, you tell the child to look both ways before they cross the street, but you still hold their hand so that they don't just go flying across the street. That'd be bad. Over imitation is the tendency of children to copy an action that isn't really relevant to part of the behavior learned. This is very common among two to six year olds in early childhood who imitate adult actions that are irrelevant. So the good thing is they have a willingness to learn. The bad thing is it's not always at appropriate times. So for example, when a child comes up and swears, everybody initially is kind of like laughing because, oh my gosh, it's so cute. But then they keep doing it over and over and over again. And, you know, you need to put a stop to it because those actions are relevant, they do not mean anything, and you do not want your five-year-old going around school swearing all the time. So how do children think during childhood? Theory theory is one theory. <laughs> so children attempt to explain everything that they see and hear and they actually can develop theories about intentions before they Im imitate actions. So this kind of happens when, if like an adult says something that's not grammatically correct and the children repeat it, but correct the grammar because they assume that the adult did it on purpose. 
Um, they often ask why a lot. They kind of revise what they think as they learn new information. But this kind of doesn't go away. It's kind of like when you're driving down the street and if there's an accident. And what you may notice is that traffic slows down on both sides of the street. On the side where there's an accident, it slows down because people are trying to get around the accident and they're being detoured or whatever to get around the accident. But on the other side, traffic also slows down because we want to see what happened. Everybody wants to see what's going on and try to explain what's going on. So it kind of doesn't go away to an extent. The theory of mind is when people think that what other people might be thinking. So this is slow to develop, but usually starts about age four. And this can be seen when young children try to escape punishment by lying. So this is like when, you know, why do you vote for who you vote for? Why do you fall in love with who you fall in love with? At two, they think that everybody thinks the same as they do. But by the age of six, they know that they don't. So this is kind of... This is kind of... Um, goes along the line with, are children good witnesses to crimes? Or is anybody a good eyewitness to a crime, as a matter of fact? If you see a crime... Normally, you're stressed. Normally, you're not thinking you're going to see a crime, so you're not really paying close attention. I actually did an experiment with one of my psychology classes before, and during the middle of lecture, I had my husband walk in, talk to me about something, and then leave. And then I asked my class what my husband looked like and what he was wearing. And only one person out of my entire class could tell me what he looked like and what he was wearing. And that's because as soon as he walked in the class, everybody just started talking amongst themselves, thinking, oh, this doesn't have anything to do with me, you know, but only one person paid attention. And it's kind of the same with crimes. You don't expect a crime to happen. So when you're walking down the street, you don't expect somebody to be attacked. So you're not going to pay close attention like that. So eyewitness accounts can be very difficult. And children sometimes are actually better witnesses. But the problem with children is they get better at lying as they get older. When children start to lie and they're young, you can tell they're lying. You can see it in their face. You can tell by what they try to say because they're just really ridiculous lies. But then as they get older, they start to get better at lying and they're more logical, and they're more advanced in their theory of mind. So it's one of those things that we just have to deal with. So the child's ability to develop these theories actually correlates, again, with the maturation of the prefrontal cortex, because this is where our executive processes occur. Executive functions lead to a better understanding of false belief. But context, experience, and culture are relevant because cultures are different, so they're going to be taught different things, and experiences are going to be different. We've talked many times about how your experiences impact future things. This is another, this is another instance of that. So, you know, for example, if you go to a party and it's the best time you've ever had in your life, you'd want to go again if somebody was having that party. But if it was the worst experience of your life, you're probably not going to want to go again. So experience dictates a lot of things. Some children, they experience punishment and pain and actually enjoy it. Others do not. So that kind of leads to what kind of adults they're going to be. So even though we're only in the ages of two to six, it's still very important to look at how we develop because how we develop now is going to correlate with what we end up as adults. So again, the witnessing a crime. Younger children are actually sometimes more accurate than older witnesses. Older witnesses can be influenced by prejudice, stereotypes, 
they get confused a lot. They actually can develop um, false ideas from words, expressions, and memories. So younger children are one of those um, kind of your roll the dice because Older adults are going to be more prejudiced, and again, they're not expecting something to be happening, but younger children may not know how to express themselves, even though they may be more accurate. They may not know where it happened or when it happened, and they may have false memories sometimes. So optimizing the witness effectiveness is you try to reduce the stress, you try to balance arousal and reassurance, and you make sure you use appropriate interviewing techniques. But again, witnesses are kind of touch and go in a nutshell. So as we age, our brain matures, we know that. Myelination occurs, scaffolding occurs. Social interaction also makes early childhood ideal for learning language. So we talked about this before, early childhood is a sensitive period, so it's the best time to master vocabulary, pronunciation, and grammar. It's not critical, it's not a must-have, but it's easier during this time. So the average child knows about 500 words at age 2 and more than 10,000 by age 6, so their vocabulary expands a lot during this period. The vocabulary explosion becomes more general, and this is where they master a lot of the types of words that we have. Fast mapping is when they have really fast ways to learn new words because they place them in mental categories according to what they perceive their meaning to be. So, for example, zoos will often place animals that are similar next to each other because it's easier for them to be identified. Logical extension is closely related to this, but this occurs when children use a word to describe other objects in the same category. So, for example, cows. You know, there's many kinds of cows. Some have spots, some don't have spots, but Children say cows, they may say Dalm Dalmatian cow um, because they can describe the other objects. Bilingual children have a tendency to blend languages, so they'll change words that they do not know to the ones from their native language. Basic grammar, so structure, techniques, rules that communicate meaning. They can apply them as they figure them out, basically. Overregularization makes language seem more regular than it actually is. So this is where you apply the rules of grammar even, ex even when exceptions occur. So, for example, you'll add an S to things that shouldn't be, to pluralize them that shouldn't be. So you might say mouses or foots or tooth. Instead of teeth, feet, mice. Pragmatics are the practical use of language. So this is very difficult for children because they have to adjust what they're saying to their audience and to the context. So this is like if you talk to a professor differently than you would talk to your mom, differently than you would talk to your friends. You can kind of adjust to your audience. Children often blurt out things that are embarrassing because they do not have pragmatics mastered yet. But as an adult, we should know that we just can't blurt things out and we need to address a professor appropriately versus your friends. So we have two positions on learning two languages. Children who are taught two languages risk becoming semilingual meaning that they will never master either. They will only become, you know, partially able to speak both. They will possibly have impaired development. However, there's little evidence that this happens. So, of course, the other position is that children learning two languages is beneficial. 
because children who hear two languages from birth usually master both. And if you use the two languages, that bilingualness will benefit the brain for a lifetime. The problem becomes that if you know two languages and then you stop speaking one, you kind of start to lose it when you don't use it, so to speak. So keep speaking both languages. Language shifts happen when they become more fluent in the school language than their home language. So, for example, if they go to an English-speaking school and they speak Spanish at home, a language shift would occur if they became more fluent in English than they did at home. So a balanced bilingual doesn't favor one over the other. They're fluent in two languages. Again, this happens when you use both of them frequently. So value both languages, use both languages frequently, and you'll be bilingual. We have five effective strategies for children. Code-focused teaching, book reading, parent education, language enhancement, and preschool programs. So these are all aimed at getting children to be able to read and be literate. So code-focused teaching uses the alphabet. Book reading, as the name implies, they read books and this allows for conversation. Parent education helps them stimulate cognition and they get education at school and at home. Language enhancement kind of expands on this. And then preschool programs, as we know, start to teach children young, teaching them songs and things like that. Quality Matters is a new initiative where all of our schools have to try to follow the quality of education because that's what really matters. So if the home educational environment is poor, Good preschool programs can actually help in their social skills and health even. And if a family provides extensive learning opportunities and encouragement, preschool is less crucial. So not all children go to preschool. And basically, the poor the educational environment at home, the more preschool helps. Child-centered programs emphasize the children's natural inclination to learn through play. Children have a tendency to be um, not, they can't sit in one place, they're antsy, so they want to play more. So as opposed to just having a teacher up there saying, okay, read pages five through eight and then answer the questions, they will actually play and act out pages five through eight kind of thing. They encourage self-paced artistic expression and exploration. And this shows the influence of Vygotsky because, again, he thought children learned through play and that children learned with adult guidance. So guided participation. Be active players in your life. Montessori schools and Reggio Emilia schools are programs that basically encourage the child's creativity. And teacher-directed programs stress academics taught by a teacher to a class. This can be beneficial, but sometimes they're expected to sit quietly, and not all children can sit quietly. But they do have a clear distinction between work and play. They're less expensive because one adult can take care of 30 children. But the important thing is that children still need that play. So even if they have this academic time to where they have to sit and listen to their teachers and do their work, they still need that recess. They still need that playtime. And oftentimes, good behavior will be rewarded. So that's more reinforcement we have going on, like Skinner thought. Project Head Start was the most widespread early education program in the United States. It began in 1965 and was funded by the federal government. Initially, it was thought to be highly su successful, but what we found was that early on, it was semi-successful, and then the gains actually started to fade. What happened was the schools that they went to after that, so the elementary schools for low socioeconomic status families, were also low quality. 
So three longitudinal research projects focused on low SES families. And what they found was that if these children had direct cognitive training, if they had, if they were taught skills and prepared for school, there was actually a reduced need for later developmental services. So start early and give them the skills they need to be successful. There was increased adult employment, adult employment, more tax revenues, and a reduced crime rate. Because what we found is that a lot of younger teenagers and even older teenagers will commit crimes because they need food or they have no other way to make money kind of thing, especially those in low SES areas. So this, these studies really showed that by giving them direction and giving them skills, children, as children, they can grow up and be productive members of society. So we really need to focus on these children because between two and six, they are making the most strides with their brain development. And you may think, well, they're only, you know, four or five, who cares? But studies show that it does matter that we should care. If we start young, they can be productive adults. And that's what's really important. So that is all for now. So we will talk about the social aspect next time. Bye.